Hello? Hello? I can't hear him. Hello? Hello? Sir? Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Can you see yes. my screen? Yes, go ahead, sir. You're on. Okay. A very good morning. I hope you can see the screen, my slides, as well as uh, hear me. If there's any problem, please do let me know. I would like to begin by thanking uh, Jacob for asking my participation in this morphology course. And the topic he assigned to me was the anatomy of the tricuspid valve. So let's go ahead. So a bit about the embryology. The formation of the atrioventricular valves, as you can see here, is from the wall of the ventricle itself. That is the dense mesenchymal tissue separates out into the leaflets and from the myocardial arises the papillary muscles and the cordy tendony. And therefore there remains a connection between the valve leaflets and the ventricular myocardium. The anterior leaflet is from the intraventricular part of the outlet septum and from the supraventricular crest. And the, and the tricuspid gully gives rise to the posterior and the septal leaflets. Now I must emphasize here, it is very important to know this embryological uh, origin because the septal leaflet plays a very critical role in the development of tricuspid regurgitation, which is what is of the primary interest to surgeons. Now once the valve is fully developed, as you can see here from the gross morphology, we have three leaflets which are seen, the anterior leaflet, the posterior leaflet, and the septal leaflet. You must pay attention to the septal leaflet as you can see that the anterior and the posterior leaflets are connected by papillary muscles and cordy tendony, while there are direct attachment of the cordy tendony from the valve leaflet to the interventricular septum in the case of the septal leaflet. Now, let's, a few gross features about the tricuspid valve. It is, of course, the largest valve in the heart, and it is the most apically placed amongst all the cardiac valves. That is, the, uh, the tricuspid is the lowest valve compared to the mitral as well as the aortic and the pulmonary. It has a normal orifice area, which is fairly large at about 7 to 9 square centimeters. The mean gradient across this valve is very low at less than 2 millimeters of mercury and the peak velocity, the diastolic velocity is less than 1 meter per second. So no gradient is actually acceptable across the tricuspid valve. Now the tricuspid valve apparatus has got four components just like the mitral valve. There is the leaflets, there are the papillary muscles, there are the caudal attachments. And of course, the annulus, which is attaching both the RA and the RV. Now, the tricuspid valve annulus is a very important structure in the uh, because most of the secondary tricuspid regurgitation occurs due to dilatation of the tricuspid annulus and is not really related to the morphology of the leaflets. Now, it is a very dynamic, D shaped annulus. And as you can see from this, computer rendition that there, there is a nearly a 30 percent change in the size between diastole and systole the c segment corresponds the c segment of the d corresponds to the ra and the rv free wall and the straight septal segment of the d the straight part of the d corresponds to the septal leaflet and the interventricular septum as i mentioned earlier it's a very dynamic structure with more than a 30 percent change in area between systole and diastole. And the normal circumference is about 12 centimeters. Now, as I mentioned earlier, it's the tricuspid annular dilatation which causes tricus secondary tricuspid regurgitation. And as you can see from these two figures, most of the dilatation occurs laterally and posteriorly, that is, in relation to the RV free wall. And the shape from 3D becomes more planar and spherical. There is less amount of 
dilatation in the septal segment as it is related to the fibrous skeleton of the heart. And as you can see from this picture, 80% of the dilatation is occurring in the region of the posterior leaflet, 10% only in the region of the septal leaflet. It does dilate. It's not that it doesn't dilate at all, but it is only very little. And about 40% can be in the region of the anterior leaflet. Now, what about the leaflet anatomy? Normally, there are about three leaflets, but there may be two or there may be more than three. The septal leaflet is the least mobile, the yellow one. It is the shortest radially and the insertion is approximately 10 millimeters apically. That means towards the apex of the heart. And it is directly attached to the interventricular septum by third order cordy tendony. The anterior leaflet is the largest, the longest, and has the greatest motion. So it is extremely important in tricuspid valve repair. The inferior leaflet is the shortest, though it dilates the maximum. It is the shortest circumferentially, and it may have multiple scallops. So it is very important to be able to decide which is the septal posterior commissure if the posterior leaflet has more than one scallop. Now, as you can see from this picture, this is very important. This anatomy is extremely important to be able to identify the commissures because placement of the tricuspid valve ring, if you are doing a tricuspid repair for a secondary tricuspid regurgitation or a functional tricuspid regurgitation is very important. And it's the antero inferior, antero inferior is this one, sorry, which is absent in about 10% of patients. This is the septo inferior, which is directly related to the coronary sinus. And this is the anteroseptal, which is the anteroseptal commissure, which is as Dr. Jacob showed you in the region of the triangle of Koch and the membranous septum. Uh, how are the commissures defined? Just like in the mitral valve, they are also defined by the presence of fan cordy. So as I mentioned earlier, as you can see here, there's the posterior leaflet, the septal leaflet, and the anterior leaflet. And all these commissures are in this particular specimen are well defined and you can see the fan cordy. Now what about the papillary muscles? The anterior papillary muscle is the largest. This one right here, which you can see, comes rises. It's a thick papillary muscle. It is supports both the anterior and the posterior leaflets and is attached, the red arrow here, to the moderator band. The posterior uh, papillary muscle can be bifid or even trifid. That means three heads. And you can see this is a posterior leaflet. It can be either bifid or trifid and it supports the posterior and the septal septal papillary muscles. And as I mentioned earlier, it's not seen on this picture, the septal leaflet right here, there is no major papillary muscle. The cordia are arising directly from the outlet septum. And therefore, some of these cordia can also be attached to the anterior septum, uh, septal leaf, uh, anterior leaflet, but a majority are attached to the septal leaflet. This is something very important for all of you to remember. What about the cordy? Now the cordy are about 80% made of collagen and 20% are elastin or endothelial cells. In the tricuspid valve, there are about 17 to 36 in number with an average of about 25. And there are various types, just like in the, uh, in the mitral valve, rough zone, fan shape, basal, free edge, and deep cordy. And false cordy are not directly connected to the leaflets. Now, as you can see here, this is what I wanted to point out. These are the septal cordy, which are directly related to the outlet septum of the of the right of the interventricular septum. And any outward bulging or bulging to the left when there is RV dilatation will tether the septal leaflet and result in functional tricuspid regurgitation. Just to repeat what Dr. Jacob showed you in real time. The triangle of cord, 
you can see the boundaries we have all studied this right from our first year in anatomy it was a very important question even in the first professional examination the tendon of todaro the septal leaflet the coronary sinus and the tendon of todaro form the boundaries and as you can see at the apex of this triangle this is the septal leaflet at the apex of this triangle both above and below the leaflet lies the membranous septum this is of course important because of the av node as you can see here the septal leaflet the av node within the triangle of koch and this is the membranous septum so we need to know this anatomy very well because any procedure on the tricuspid valve can easily result in complete heart block so you must know this anatomy absolutely correctly because this is very important for identification of the atrioventricular node as you can see this is a view for in of a ring which has been implanted unfortunately this is an autopsy specimen seen from the ventricular side just to show you that the gap where the membranous septum is and where the bundle of koch and the av node are and this of course is the patient has also got a simultaneously a mitral valve replacement now what are the structures related to the tricuspid valve this is extremely important again because whenever we are taking stitches for tricuspid annuloplasty which is the most common procedure done on the tricuspid valve is uh, we must know all these structures so as you can see here the non coronary sinus is directly related to the anteroseptal commissure of the tricuspid valve if we move anteriorly the proximal part of the rca which is not shown here but which arises from the right coronary sinus is fairly distant from the tricuspid annulus but as it goes inferiorly it is only about 3 mm away from the tricuspid annulus so you should always be aware where when you take stitches parallelly on this annulus that the rca is not too far away similarly the av node as seen here lies again about 3 to 5 mm behind the tri uh, tricuspid annulus in relation to the septal leaflet so this is again very important so as you can see here this is the tendon of todaro which is a, a collagenous band connecting the right atrium to the ivc but this av node right here at the apex of the triangle of koch related to the septal leaflet this is where complete heart block occurs if your needle goes through this av node but we must also be aware of the rca and the and the non coronary sinus because deep stitches can also cause aortic regurgitation if you have gone through it seems impossible but it has been reported and it does happen we must also remember the relationship of the ivc and the svc of course to the tricuspid valve and you will be surprised i was a bit surprised that the svc and the ivc can be about the same size though we always think of the ivc to be much larger than the svc so what are the differences between the tricuspid anatomy and the mitral valve a uh, mitral valve anatomy in the tricuspid valve we have two discrete papillary muscles anterior and medial or, or the posterior one as i as i mentioned the there is the third septal papillary muscle is usually a conglomerate of different types of small papillary muscles or direct attachment of the cordy to the outlet septum and like i mentioned cordy from the septal posterior and rv free wall and the moderator band causes tethering in functional tr the annulus is three dimension uh, three dimensional and has greater asymmetry as compared to the mitral valve and annular dilatation occurs in the ap diameter as you can see here i had shown it earlier also this is the free wall that dilates resulting in uh, functional tricuspid regurgitation because of loss of co cooptation again the same thing shown here the importance of the rv free wall so whenever the rv dilates the rv free wall dilates the posterior part of the annulus dilates the anterior dilates too so both of them dilate and pull the leaflet away similarly the cordy attached to the interventricular septum 
if there is bowing of the interventricular septum, there is displacement of the septal leaflet, and you will get tricuspid regurgitation, functional tricuspid regurgitation, wherein the leaflet morphology is normal. When you have tricuspid stenosis, the leaflet morphology won't be normal. There may be uh, thickening of the tricuspid leaflets or there is associated tricuspid stenosis because of commissural fusion. But functional TR, these leaflets are normal, pulled apart because of displacement of the RV free wall, displacement of the interventricular septum, resulting in tricuspid regurgitation, secondary usually to left-sided left valvular heart disease. One of the other well-known causes of uh, tricuspid regurgitation is due to placement of pacemaker leads. As you can see here, the pacemaker lead has, been, has to be placed in the, anchored in the right ventricular musculature, passing through the tricuspid valve and is embedded within the uh, trabecula of the right ventricle. And therefore, this may result in iatrogenic tricuspid regurgitation. So finally, what do we see as a surgeon? We see, this is the view for the surgeon. You see the septal leaflet, the anterior leaflet, the posterior leaflet, the triangle of cotch, the AV node, the fossa ovalis, the tendon of Todaro, like which I mentioned, is a collagenous band connecting the right atrium to the IVC and the coronary sinus. And as I mentioned again, it's very important. This is the area where you have to be very careful in placing your sutures. And the open end of the tricuspid ring lies exactly in this area. So the last sutures are placed here and vertically above from the coronary sinus. So therefore, you can avoid putting any stitches in this area and avoid complete heart block. I'll just go to the next slide and then come back. Now, one important aspect you must always remember is sizing of the ring when you do a tricuspid valve, uh, valve annuloplasty. So, usually the, it is the ring size desired by placing the ring sizer between the two commissures of the septal leaflet. And as you can see here, this is a 30 ring, which is a fairly large ring. We often use a 26 or a 28. And you can see that the tricuspid annulus is very enlarged, but the, this distance between the two commissures of the septal leaflet are corresponding to a 30 size. You can see the large. This is easily, this annulus can be shortened to a 30 size. And therefore, usually it is recommended that you undersize by two. That means this 30, in this particular annular dilatation, a 26 size. Uh, Anuroplasty ring will give the best results, as was published by Phil Sufi many years ago. Actually, that there was only one recurrence out of 75 cases when the ring size used was 26 to 28. For the younger surgeons who are participating in this seminar, I would like to point out: never feel intimidated by seeing a very large tricuspid circumference, a very dilated annulus, and think, "Oh no, I must put a large ring." If you put a 32 ring in this, thinking that, you know, otherwise there will be difficulties, you are likely to get recurrence much, much more than if you cut it down and use, cut it down by two sizes. So whatever size you get right here, by measuring the, the septal distance, you can undersize by one or two. This is extremely important. Undersizing is extremely important. And this is just an operative picture to show you the fallacies in placement of the ring. You see, this is a perfectly placed ring because this is, you can see the valve is completely competent and the ring and the area of the membranous septum, AV node, triangle of cotch is free of any stitches. These are just operative photographs taken from an article from Kavada and Journal of Cardiovascular and Thoracic Surgery in 2018, where there, if you, if you are not able to identify the commissures accurately, you may place the ring in a wrong direction. So identification of the commissures accurately, placing the stitches accurately, will give you a good result, of course, with proper sizing. Now, the final slide, I just would like to again emphasize, this is survival under medical management. 
let me tell you very honestly i have been practicing cardiac surgery for the last 30 years and the maximum grief both to the surgeon in the long term and to the patient is recurrent or residual severe tricuspid regurgitation so i would suggest and i think that's such common thinking nowadays that we need to be aggressive in treating moderate to severe tricuspid regurgitation because if you don't do that as you can see in this slide 10 year survival in a very large group of patients with severe tr the survival is dismal at the end of 10 years so moderate to severe tr as you can see from this uh, survival curve is very poor and therefore if you leave the patient with significant residual or recurrent tricuspid regurgitation the patient will continue to have a poor functional class and continue to require high doses of diuretics and continue to have congestive cardiac failure so the importance of the tricuspid valve should not be overlooked either by the cardiologist or by the surgeons and that is why it is not for no reason that it is often been called the cinderella of cardiac valve because it we tend to ignore it just like cinderella was ignored so once again i would like to thank you all for your patient hearing and i would like to thank jacob for inviting me if there are any questions i am more than happy to answer thank you jacob 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 can you hear me hello hi uh, thank you thank you so much sir is there any question i can take um sir we'll leave the questions for the end sir i think okay i i have got another function to a uh, meeting to attend that's why i just asked if it was possible if i can answer it otherwise you can take the questions later okay sir i'll do that thank you sir okay thank you so much mm hey put this on hello thing what uh, what all dr sk nair had taught us dr sk nair is actually my teacher from chitra from those days so we are very extremely happy to have him here with us um thank you so much sir um this this preparation is a uh, is a preparation where you transilluminate the um the valves from underneath and this is how you will see the see the tricuspid valve so this is the septum and this is the septal leaflet this large leaflet is the anterior leaflet and this small fellow is the posterior leaflet so this preparation shows you septal leaflet anterior leaflet posterior leaflet whilst we are just here i might as well just show you the mitral valve and you can see the aml the large pml that is the anterolateral commissure and this is the postromedial commissure we would be coming back to it but just just once we are here so aml pml anterolateral commissure postromedial commissure and i think now you are very familiar with the tricuspid valve okay so now we will go on to the right ventricle and we have dr ravi agarwal here with us and uh, he would be talking to us about the right ventricle now